Hello, welcome to Tuesday Live. I am Omini Odan. Climate change, a global phenomenon, is increasingly posing challenges. In this part of the globe, issues such as desert encroachment and coastal or sea rise threatens human security. There are studies by 2100 that the world oceans could rise between 28 to 131 centimeters depending on how much heat trapping gas is expelled by industries and vehicles and alarming statistics that could spell doom. On the other hand, the consequences of desertification affect millions of people as more arable and pastoral land is lost annually. Worrisome for many are human economic activities which are leading cause of climate change and its adverse effects. Analysts say with desert encroachment in the north and sea rise in the south, the land mass will reduce and people forced to struggle for arable land that could result in violence. Places like the Netherlands and Bangladesh have built floating gardens and floating farms to fight climate change. What lessons here for Nigeria? How far will the Great Green Wall Initiative in Nigeria? Answers and more with those who should know after this background report by Mia Ogidi. It is now a shared fact among almost all Nigerians that climate change is real, as the evidence about its presence has assumed a scaring dimension. You start from the north, uh, you have the receding Lake Chad, you also have desertification, drought threatening farmers, you have forced migration, people are moving from the north to the south, and then you come to the middle belt, we talk about the Sudanization of the uh, Guinea savanna. In other words, um, because of the effects of desertification, people are moving into the Guinea savanna, which is the buffer zone, and the implication of that is you have conflict over resources. With this, Farmers and pastoralists scramble for green vegetation to make ends meet, which in most cases result in violence. Not only farming activities, even livestock activities. So the uh, herdsmen now move to areas where they can get fodder for their animals. And in, the, uh, in that process, there are conflict because they're trespassed into farms. And these are the uh, reasons that brings all this conflict. Basically, we attribute it to aspect of climate change. While the government and the security agencies rise to the occasion to restore peace, measures to mitigate climate change are also receiving attention. We have a document that is known as the Nationally Determined Contribution, the NDC document, that is focusing on five key sectors, agriculture, uh, uh, transportation is one of it, power is another uh, aspect, industries is part of it, and then agriculture. So these are the, by scientific findings, these are the major economic sectors that contribute the most to greenhouse gases emissions within the country. So if you want to solve the problem, you have to start tackling it. And it was also announced by the Ministry of Water Resources that there's going to be an international conference on recharging the lecture in the coming uh, weeks. So these are all collective efforts that are really being put in place to ensure that we combat uh, uh, climate change. The 2018 budget of the Federal Ministry of Environment in Nigeria dedicates huge amount of money to the Great Green Wall project to restore lost forest as international organizations also come to the head. So we're going to put a lot of pressure on the National Agency for the Great Green Wall to deliver results and that's why the collaboration with FAO will come into play to strengthen our capacity to strengthen our means of doing some of these things according to all best practice and to ensure that the lost and degraded land are recovered 
and kept in a manageable and sustainable way. There are a couple of challenges facing Nigeria that we are working with them to address. For instance, you moving up, he mentioned the restoration of degraded lands, mm -hmm. which is juxtaposed with issues of livestock, farmers, and all kinds of other aspects. FAO would work with him. While the government put in all its energies to address the climate change induced security challenges in the country. Individuals were also advised to imbibe in environment-friendly practices such as afforestation. Mayor Ogede, Antines. Climate change security impact. That will be the focus on Tuesday Live tonight. Tuesday Live is an audience participation program. On the course of the program, we'll open the lines and if you're true to the live studio, Turn down the volume of your set to avoid the haul back and go straight to the point. And you can also join us through other social media platforms. I have on set tonight to sustain discussion on climate change security impact in Nigeria. The Honorable Minister of State for Environment, Ibrahim Osman Jibril. Thanks for joining us on Tuesday Line. Thank you, Allah. Professor Hilary Inyang, world renowned geoenvironmental scientist. An expeditionist who served as endowed distinguished professor and institute director at the University of Massachusetts and University of North Carolina, United States, two time vice chancellor and winner of 26 awards, including the National Order of Merit in Science and Technology. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank and you. from the Lagos Network Center, we have Dr. Newton Jubinor. Dr. Newton Juvenal is founder, fight against desert encroachment. Explorer who crossed the world's largest desert alone two times. He's leading bright green trail across Sahara Desert. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much and for having me and uh, Happy New Year to everybody. The General of the National Agency for Great Green World Goni Ahmed. Thanks for joining us on Tuesday Live. Thank you very much. Beautiful gentlemen. Let me begin from a general perspective. Starting with the Honorable Minister. What are the governance policies in the Ministry of Environment, especially in relationship with climate change and national security? Thank you very much, Jim. And, uh, let me start by saying that uh, Climate change issue is also a security issue, particularly in Nigeria. And the Federal Ministry of Environment is at the forefront of this issue. We have a complete department of climate change headed by a director. And it's a highly technical department because uh, there are scientific officers who are there to drive the policy direction sure of its implementation. Just before the beginning of this program, in the opening shots, you saw the Director of Climate Change talking about the national determined contribution. Uh, it is a known fact that human activities, both industrial and others, lead to the emission of greenhouse gases that assist in changing the climate, in warming the, uh, the atmosphere. Therefore, Having known that this is in existence, it is important for government all over the world to come forward and do something to mitigate this situation. And so a series of conferences were on until 2015 when the Paris uh, Agreement took place, COP21, and uh, we're lucky our president was there along with many other world leaders. Before the Paris Agreement, every nation was asked to submit its intended determined contribution. After the Paris Agreement, we turned this INDC to NDC, that is National Determined Contribution. Nigeria, as a policy, decided that we are going to reduce emission by 25% by the year 2020, unconditional, sorry, 20% unconditional, and 45% conditional by the year 2030. 
That means without any assistance from anywhere, we are determined to do what we could to reduce emission that leads to global warming in our own part of the country. And uh, if we get assistance by funding technical and expertise from other parts of the world and global players, we could go up to 45%. So as a matter of policy, we have a national determined contribution. And in this, we're targeting areas of emission. We're looking at gas flaring in the country. We're looking at harmful agricultural practices. The way a manor trees are cut down, leading to deforestation, and reducing the quantity of forests that could observe this carbon dioxide that are harmful to the atmosphere is not something that is palatable to us. And as part of the measures to mitigate these issues, that is what led us to launching the Green Bond at the end of last year, and uh, it is targeted at some key projects like solar energy, which is renewable and which does not lead to emission, and therefore can assist us in achieving our determined contribution. Forestation to make sure that we not only reclaim what was lost, but plant new areas and make sure that we have heavy forest cover. Nigeria, as it is today, is just about 5% forest cover. This is far below the world standard which is about 20-25% approved. So we need to do more, and we have to come up with sound policies that will assist us in achieving this determined contribution. Uh, climate change is real. Uh, you cannot joke with it. You do it at your own peril, and the government is serious about it. The president, having gone to Paris, went ahead to New York to sign the Paris Agreement, and he followed it off last year in May to sign the instrument of ratification, which was deposited at the United Nations. So we have done all that is needed by way of policy to ensure that climate change is put at the front burner of our discourse. Okay, beautiful. Let me go to Professor Hilary Young. Given the nationally determined contribution by Nigeria, it therefore put one thing straight, political will towards mitigating adverse effects of climate change as put forward by the minister. Now, the One Planet Summit in Paris has ended. The world leaders plead, pleaded wide-range commitment towards making the Paris Agreement on Climate Change a reality. Now, to the question, quoting UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, he said, we need to mobilize resources by the international community to support the countries, communities of these states, that is Nigeria inclusive, Africa, to build resilience for their societies to mitigate adverse effects in climate change. Given what Nigeria has put in place and looking at the central thing we are talking about tonight, climate change security impact, where are we? Well, um uh, the Honorable Minister has given a very good rendition of um, what uh, the country has had to do uh, and is excellent because uh, Nigeria uh, had had to join the rest of the world in uh, the promulgation of policies and those policies are mainly those of uh, mitigation, you know, in climate, to address climate change. There are usually two major approaches and both are complementary. There's a mitigation which really rests on policy. Uh, you can look at mitigation as the preventive approach, yeah. but there is the, what I would call, adaptation approach, which is the other end of things. So what you are basically asking me is, um, where is Nigeria in that regard? I can say that um, and Nigeria has many instruments that it can use to address the adaptation part. Adaptation deals with, we know this is going to happen, and some of it has already happened. Where, where are we? What should we do about it? No. I must say that in most countries, uh, dealing with issues of adaptation are at the inceptive stage. You don't have the full, um, what I would call, um, uh, you don't have the full manipulation of factors of the economy to deal with that yet because it has to do with uh, a lot in commerce, 
a lot in um, occupational changes, for example, a lot of fishermen in the Niger Delta will lose that occupation if things go the way they are, if the storms get going the way they are. A lot of mangrove in that part of the world. And you've already seen what has happened in the north, uh, that um, there's a lot of desertification. You, you heard that. Uh, a lot of people are being displaced, and a lot more will be displaced. It will be a two-thronged approach to the middle belt of Nigeria from the south, as you have a lot of inundation of coastal areas and the impact of that on agriculture. Then you have in the north. So the middle belt will become the point of convergence of all of this. What about the security implications? Well, the security implications uh, of this is rather obvious that uh, when you have people displaced, and people have been talking about the political end of things, but really there is the physiological part of, physiographic part of things, in which the vegetation, uh, in which uh, patterns of rainfall changes determine where one lives, because most people in Nigeria are still farmers, if you look at it, yes. So it is not really that um, uh, it is only that conflicts will come from one side. It will come from the south as well. So the security aspect of this is that when one's people are displaced a lot from their occupation as a result of climate, you should expect social tumult. Okay. That happens in most parts of the world. And okay. by the way, it's all along the West African Sahara Belt. It's not just in Nigeria. Okay. We'll, we'll get to that. Now quickly, DG Great Green World Projects. We're looking at, there are three major tripods now globally, looking at uh, terrorism, migration, climate change. Tonight we are trying to match two, given the situation in the country today, climate change, security impacts. How far is the journey? Give us the status of your project in Nigeria, in line with the broader picture we are looking at tonight. Um, thank you. My listeners did it very well. Um, you see, climate change is specifically uh, uh, spoken by the companies. It's, uh, it's a global issue. It's something happening somewhere else. Africa have less to do with that. But the first casualty of that climate change is uh, people that are living in the climate. It has caused a lot of problems there. It's bringing in hot, desiccating wind. The desert is encroaching. And uh, the biological diversity of that place is drastically being reduced. Um, productivity of that land is drastically reduced. Water points are dry. These are the major causes of social unrest. Human beings have to take some measure on how they live and they protect themselves. That is what is causing this forced immigration. In a place where you are getting uh, cultural land, well, the place was protected, vegetation is there, the, uh, the, the wind is I mean, blowing less, you are, I mean, on one hectare, you'll be, I mean, getting about 20, 30 bucks. But now, you hardly get 10 bucks or less per hectare in that area. So, drastically, that has reduced, I mean, productivity of, in the area, forced migration. What are the things to be done? This is one of the major reasons why the government of Nigeria took, in fact, an initiative to the African Union to see that, I mean, we look at it from the global angle, the regional angle, whereby Africa will specifically look at the dry area and see what are the things they are supposed to do. And that's why the Great Green Wall came on board, the African Union bought the idea. I mean, all African heads of states signed convention of establishing this sort of agency in each of these countries. And there are 11 countries that are involved in that. Yeah. 11 counties, Nigeria is one of them. Then coming back home here, I mean, it happens that coincidentally also here in Nigeria, we have 11 states that are directly impacted by this, I 
I mean, climate change, which is bringing about desertification and so on and so forth. So the agency came on board, and uh, recently the president signed the ratification for this convention to give it a good support. This uh, this agency went through the Act of National Assembly before, and I mean, uh, uh, an act was put in place to establish this agency. We are now operating, and we are operating in 11 states, and already we have started to um, measure some sort of success in these areas, and we are working with the communities understood, but letting them have taken a lot of studies. That, that is actually the point I was I trying to get out from you now. Now, when the Great Green Work Project in Nigeria was established, a lot of persons who didn't understand it seemed to ask a lot of questions. What is it all about? Some felt it's one of those channels to siphon funds out of the economy, but it is clear from the explanation that the reality is on ground. So basically, beyond the fact that we have seen the journey the project has gone so far, you talked about 11 states, right? Yes. So 11 states, which states, and where are we with the project right now, given the challenge on, on ground? Can you just mention the, the states briefly? Yeah, I'll tell you the states. First of all, first of all the reasons of putting the Great Green Wall is for two main reasons. One is to improve the livelihood of the people there, because there's no way you just Head on, take on, uh, on climate change and uh, afforestation, whatever and so on, without looking at the people themselves and understand them and give them some hope and bring bring some sort of activities that will develop I mean, their own livelihood in the area before coming out to plant trees, whatever and so on. Uh, we have 11 states, starting from Adamawa, Bauchi, Gombe, Kano. These are called buffer states. But the main frontline states, Gawas, Borno, Yobe, um, Zamfara, Jigawa, um, Kebi, Sokoto, uh, these are the states covering the front line of the Great Green Wall. And in these states, where we have the uh, front line states, we established a series of shelter belts to dissipate the wind flow in order to ensure that, I mean, some land is protected. While in the buffer states, we go in to establish a lot of wood lots and so on because a lot of, I mean, uh, uh, firewood and so on is being exported from that area and so on. So we establish wood lots and then give them some sort of uh, fruit trees and so on and so forth. This is the essence. This is what the Great Green Wall is doing. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let's get to Lagos now where Dr. Newton Juvenal has joined us on, on Tuesday Live. Dr. Well, looking at the central theme of Tuesday Live tonight, give us the global initiative in terms of connection between climate change and global security. Can we have that? Thank you very much. Um, let me take off from where the prof stopped when he talked about uh, mitigation and adaptation. The, um, the whole climate change issue, actually, we, got the, we felt it in the early 70s, 72, 73, and 74. During that period, a good part of the Saharan region went for almost a few years without rainfall. And that brought about immense drought that affected a number of countries in Africa, Sudan, uh, Niger, Chad, uh, even as far down to Ethiopia, as you may recall. And then, of course, almost 11 states in Nigeria, as was stated by the DG. What we have tried to do, especially when I became a a player. By the way, let me correct one or two things that was uh, mentioned during the introduction. I have explored the Sahara four times, two times alone and two with a group of scientists. Um, when we noticed, or at the time we started realizing the effect of climate change following the desertification coming from the encroachment of the desert, the advocacy that came out of 
the scientific body, the scientific bo uh, uh, group, resulted in uh, the establishment of a, num a number of uh, uh, water basin authorities in the country, again to mitigate this. Outside the uh, water basin authorities, we also saw that the Lake Chad was drying up. And apart from the Lake Chad situation, which continued to deteriorate over a period, the, the Ministry of Environment was created in 1999 as part of the advocacy that followed a number of the issues that I mentioned. Now, once we, once we had all this desertification issue, plus the disappearance of greenery along the fringes of the Sahara, migration started. Because when communities are faced with, especially in the nomadic Fulani territories, and I'm not talking of just Nigeria, you have this whole issue going across from Nigeria down to Niger, to Chad, even as far down to Mauritania. If and when the, their grazing fields are, are disappeared, what do they do? They start coming southwards. Initially, they will come with a number of their cattle heads, not everything, and it was seasonal. That is, they were able to keep their main stock and take those ones that are aging, those ones that they want to make a bit of money from after their practice of wonderful husband, animal husbandry. They bring them across many states in the country and through different urban centers, getting rid of those stock as they go along. That was how it started in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But of course, as the whole is, at the time the whole thing got so bad, they started bringing out everything because they were, the, all the greeneries had disappeared completely. And that is where the security issue is, 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 is of so much concern to so many people because uh, I, I, I did point out some time ago that we are not even sure if all this migration issue is coming only from the northern part of Nigeria. Because of our porous border situation, the Chadians are coming through the same source, the uh, Nigerians are coming through the same source, and even northern Cameroon, they are also coming in through the same source. And coming to where they can find a bit of greenery. And that is where the security issue is, is so difficult to handle because what do you do with millions of migrants coming from the territories that I've mentioned, looking for greenery to, uh, to graze and and having most of them trampling on people's farms. So that is where the whole problem lies. Uh, but if you ask me to, 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 to put forward uh, some kind of recommendation, until we get the, the, the lecture going again, until we are able to put the, until we are able to put the until we are able to put the, until we are able to... Doctor, we'll, we'll come back to you on the area of the accommodation. I, I think, gentlemen, I think he has given, so far we have given a clear cut direction. A number of persons before now, or before this point, may not have realized truly that climate change has a major, has a major role or is a major factor uh, within the security challenge we have in the country. He has said a couple of things that this migration is not 
might not only be coming from the northern part of the country, it could come from the south, it is not only Nigeria. And looking at it, back to the minister now, based on the substantive policy of the Federal Ministry of Environment, how do we address the induced unrest in many parts of the country in search of water and vegetation to sustain animal agriculture, especially cattle? Well, thank you. Again, a very difficult situation, but then problems are meant to be solved, not for us to complain about, but to find ways to solve these problems for the good of our people. Uh, Dr. Jubno has mentioned the drying of the Lake Chad. When Lake Chad was at its peak in the 60s, it was about the size of Nasrallah State. Nasrallah State is about 27,000 square kilometers. Lake Chad was about 25,000 square kilometers. Now Lake Chad is just about 2,000 of its original size. And when that lake was booming, there was a lot of economic activities. The fishing activities, the fishing community living there, the livestock activities, the farming activities. Remember the Chad Basin? There was even a flour mill in Meduguri that was getting wheat from the Chad Basin as a result of irrigation from the Lake Chad. These things have completely disappeared. No more fishing activities, no more uh, farming activities, no more livestock. And incidentally, this is an area where you have the largest number of cattle stock. And just like the doctor said, this migration was seasonal. Those of us who stay in the north central part of the country know this very well. The cattle rearers who move down at the end of the rainy season when Harvesting is taking place in the north central part of this country. They will move on, take on the uh, fodders after the harvest, whether it is rice or corn, they uh, browse on it and take as much as they could. There was no conflict. Even if there were, we know the cattle routes. They were well gazetted in the whole northern part of the country. We know the grazing reserves. Most people commenting about this issue of security today do not even know the difference between cattle roads, grazing reserve, and many other things associated with livestock in this country. But we know very well that when these people were coming in the 60s and 70s, they would come at the end of their dry season. When the rains are about to come here, they move back to their base. And just like the doctor pointed out, after the draft of 1972-73, after the drying of the Lake Chad, there was very little left for them to grow. And to worsen the situation, the insurgency came. And because there was no security there, they had to move in. People don't remember or don't even associate the issues of the insurgency with the crisis in Libya. People don't realize how many people from the, that part of the country, in Chad, in Cameroon, in Nigeria, in Nigeria, have gone to Libya and worked with Gaddafi. After his demise, most of them were hunted out. And a lot of them escaped with their arms, the AK-47. How do you explain the Katsura are going about with AK-47 when he's not with a stick or at worst a machet? How did the AK-47 come? Nobody asked these questions. And these are serious issues. The grazing reserves have been lost. The cattle routes, known as brutally in the local language, are also lost. And when they move from areas where it was relatively safe down to this place, now they cannot move back again because of the insurgency. And that means they are now going to be permanent instead of seasonal. And staying permanently means they will have to encroach on people's farmland. Most people don't understand this relation. There is a strong correlation between the issue of climate change and the insurgency as well as the migratory activities that are happening now in the country. Before, they are even restricted because the tether fly is harmful to the cattle. So they hardly go beyond the niger benue axis. If you go to Baelsa today, if you go to Potago today, if you go to Kalawa today, you'll see the cattle yeah, yes. activities. That means it is a competition for resources. And don't forget, when these things were peaceful, 
and independent, how was the population of Nigeria? Was it up to 35 million or so? Now, what is the population of Nigeria? The land did not change. Instead, we've even lost land through land degradation, gully erosion, desert encroachment. If you travel to the north, if you travel to Yobe, if you go to places like Mimalari, Yusufari, in Yobe state, you will see what I'm talking about, desert encroachment. The sand dunes are moving southward at an alarming rate of 400 meters per annum. The oasis where they have little water are covered. Villages are covered. So there are no longer rangeland. Again, moving down to this part where the Guinea savanna used to be dominant, it is suddenly turning into Sudan savanna. And the Sudan has turned into Sahel, the Sahel to the desert. So these are critical climate-related issues that must be addressed if we have to find peace in this country. It is not about sentiments. You have to know this scientifically is proof. The professor has discussed it, the doctor has mentioned it, but most people, when they comment, particularly on social media and even the mainstream, it is about sentiment. Sentiment will not carry us to anywhere. We have to sure. understand these issues sure. scientifically and yeah. find a lasting solution. The government is doing something. We know the problem of water is there. But what happened to the lakes? What happened to the dams built across the country? That is why the pyramids of water resources is important. That is why their new program of training, that is getting these dams that were silting, the canals that have silted, the areas where typhoid grass have taken over and the waters have reduced, therefore you don't have enough to irrigate your land. Federal Ministry of Environment is handling that and we are partnering with them as stakeholders in the environment sector to ensure that this program is up and running. Again, the issue of farming activities. Nigeria has gone beyond the issue of seasonal farming, where you have to farm rain fed and wait for another six months in some part of the country. What is happening in Cape instead now, with the rice issue and the Ebony state, where the Ebony rice is also coming up, is something to show that government is really serious and determined to look at this. Well, let, 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 let me just interject briefly. You mentioned two core things. Population explosion. Yes. The land not expanding. Yeah. Yes. And uh, back to the One Planet Summit that just ended in Paris. Yes. You went in the delegation led by the President and Commander in Chief, President Muhammadu Buhari. Yeah. Let me give this cue before I ask Professor Hilary this question. President Muhammadu Buhari led Nigeria's delegation to the summit, yes. which underscores the federal government's commitment on delivering on climate change yes. secured future. Yes. Nigeria at the summit made strong representation to the international community for her inclusion in climate regional programs yes. by providing strong financial support for its planned the plan replenishment of the lake chart. Yes. Now looking at this, meaning government is not just folding its arms, government realizes this problem and it's not just talk talk but trying to walk the talk. Yes. Now Give us how will you how will you how how will you how will it affect us as a country and what do we need to do as a nation to mitigate the consequences based on the analysis given by the minister? How about uh, go too far? To what? Yes, sure. The minister has given a very good rendition of um, uh, some of the factors. I say most of them that has led to this uh, circumstance. But I would like not to just talk about mitigation, but what needs to be done, including adaptation. Yes, adaptation is very important because uh, the general public will normally see adaptation more than they see mitigation. Mitigation is more encased in policies at the international level. But um, uh, let me say this, there are usually uh, six kinds of things, things cat categories of uh, methods to use in solving a problem of this nature, a problem that has time elements and space elements. So first you have regulations, that is the preserve of government, right? And the minister has talked about what has been done there. And the next one is policies. So the third one that is extremely important is to set up technical guidance systems that will help the country in addressing a lot of those things 
are a, a sort of a nested in technical measures that need to be implemented. Be that the green wall. You know, even to build, to plant trees, there are some very specific types of trees and heights of trees that will catch the sand in the wind. So it's not just building those. The country's research institutions have to come up. Nigeria has a lot of talent with measures to be used to address some of this. So number one, we don't have in Nigeria very many capable research institutions. Now, I don't, I don't mean capable people. Nigeria has a lot of people. But the, a way of harvesting the talent to address things of this nature. So Nigeria's research institutes, agricultural and environmental, needs to rise up to the challenge. Then the other one uh, is the existence. I used to head the US EPA Office of Technical Guidance many years ago uh, in the US. Because a lot of the issues were so new that we had to develop technical guidance manuals for engineers in the country to know what to do when all these uh, contaminated sites, superfund sites came up. Nigeria needs to do the same so that uh, the young people would be trained in measures. We try to harvest their talent to address these things. Then there is the issue of um, incentives, market incentives. The government can promote good behavior uh, in the general population by market incentives. What is there? Uh, do you have many solar powered panels in a particular state? Why don't government exercise the first attempt to make sure that whenever a government institution or a government facility is to be lighted, the first thing is uh, solar? So that the government itself provides that market incentive. You are going to have many solar technicians all over this country. Because in a lot of places, you don't have to have central electricity. You can have distributed electricity. So there are many measures like that. The next is, where is the country's um, biennial environmental report? We need to have that because that's how you can gauge whether the ecology of this place has maintained its integrity over time. So we don't have data at the level of spatial density that is necessary to have to do things that will help in environmental impact assessments, ecological assessments, and all that. And it's not just the Ministry of Environment. The Ministry of Environment alone cannot do that. We are talking about an archival system for data that are generated by projects, by Shell, by all of those. So we need to have that a biennial state of the environment report for Nigeria that will help in planning at various jurisdictional levels, at the national, state, and local government levels. There are many others, but I don't want to. Okay, let me, let's get to Lagos. Dr. Jibuno, following up from where Professor Hilary stopped, I remember vividly when the, uh, the Federal Republic of Nigeria started talking about sustainable forest management. We had issues of alternative livelihood options for the communities where forest reserves were to, take, were to be established, where national parks were to be established. And as soon as this was addressed, it was resolved. So following from what Professor Larry said, what's your take? Well, let me break it down for you. Um, the minister talked about, the honorable minister talked about uh, the, uh, the way the sand dunes uh, is moving from the Sahara, bringing about desertification. What do we do to stop that? The only way, or what we have at the moment, is the Great Green Wall, which replaced the Shelter Belt Commission. How do we get Lake Chad to start uh, supplying enough water to enable the greenery to return? Because, you see, we, we must address some of these issues. If, if we, let, okay, let's go back a little bit. This kind of migration did not happen 20, 25 years ago. Why? Because they had enough greenery along those belts to graze all their animal heads. And like I mentioned earlier on, they only brought to the south 
limited amount of, uh, of stock to sell and then go back and it was seasonal. But now we have a situation where they are migrating everything because all the greeneries have disappeared. And it's also a major threat to, to the South because like the Honorable Minister mentioned, at Independence we had over or close to 40% 40 forest, 40 forest cover. Today it's less than 7%. So you can begin to see the threats. Direction. Especially when we link that threat to security issues. Just to give a direction. Security issues. For that direction, sir. In back greenery. For that direction, sir. In back greenery. For that the professor had talked about, he said it's not only about mitigation. Adaptation is also a factor. Where is the place of mobilization in all this? You see, yes, I tend to agree a little bit with the, with the professor, but for me, mitigation is, is, is more important than adaptation. Because if you mitigate, you reduce the effect of some of these uh, catastrophes that we are facing today. Why do we have to spend so much on adaptation? Whereas we can mitigate, help to kind of... Uh, reduce the effect some of these things are having before, I mean, they are having on, on, on human and animal uh, stock. Before we begin to talk about uh, adaptation. Adaptation, yes, fine, because we are now in a position, or we are trying to be in a position where we can begin to adapt to the fallout from the various catastrophes that are happening as a result of climate change. But we must, first of all, do whatever we can to mitigate against those, uh, those phenomena. So that, that's the point that I'm trying to, 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 to raise here. If we can bring back the water uh, uh, basin authorities to start b b supplying uh, water for irrigation for farmlands, and like the Honorable Minister said, people can begin to have two seasonal croppings in the year or even three, depending on what you're planting, and also to, to, to develop the greenery. If we don't have the shelter belt, if we don't have the, the great green wall to stop the, the, the desert from encroaching, then this whole thing is going to, just going to be a continuous adaptation, a trying to adapt to the, to the problems that, that are coming from, 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 from all these uh, problems. What will you say about mobilization? What will you say about mobilization? Mobilization, the aspect of mobilization. 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 There's a problem with the sound, I'm not hearing you. Mobilization. Problem with the sound, I'm not hearing you. It's of mobilization in this. Community as well. Make them partners in the because they, 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 you know, community involvement, partnership with, with the various communities is, is going to be the, for me, the actual mobilization you need. Thank you very much. Back to Abuja. Let's quickly take uh, the phone lines are open and uh, let's take this call from Sunny calling in from Katna. Hello, Sunny. Welcome to Tuesday Live. Hello. Good evening. Hello, Sunny. Hello. You are on to Tuesday Live. Hello, I'm Bill William. I'm Sunny Balara, calling you from Gachikol, Kaduna. Go ahead. You see, uh, first of all, I would like to commend the management of NTA for bringing, for bringing in this topic as climate change. Now, my own contribution to this uh, very good program that uh, affected each and every person in the ecosystem. You see, my suggestion here is that uh, we have to take, you know, a precaution, it's not that precautionary motive. Uh, I mean, the issue of environment together with national orientation agency have to collaborate 
in orienting people to know the effects and the influences of human activities to the world climatic changes. Uh, I will start an example with my, you know, local community. Because there are some, you know, religious beliefs that most of, you know, our ethnic groups doesn't believe on, you know, this effect of greenhouse effect. That they don't know that it is them that is to change their environment. Because the possibility for a man in an environment, man can change environment. Now, what I'm suggesting is that Nigeria has succeeded, even though there are some interventions from World Bank in eradicating polio. That is to say, the Federal Ministry of Environment has to initiate a program that will be going around and be educating people to know that they are distorting their ecosystem. And this desert encouragement, desert has encouraged in a situation in which, you know, as uh, the minister, uh, one of the discussions there said, uh, the vegetation are changing from Sudan savanna to Sahel savanna. Yes, it is real. Because our people lack orientation. They need orientation. They need to know what they are doing to, to the, 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 the people living in the environment. They have to protect their environment. They are distorting their, their environment. Because if you come here to Kaduna in my area in Regachukung, if you meet a man cutting down tree, if you tell him that you are distorting the ecosystem, he will not believe you. There are some certain inputs that you have to tell that man from certain words for him to be convinced that he is disturbing his environment. On the other hand, you see, the government has to eat, eat, eat something because people are cutting firewood, some are doing for, for, for timbering, and some are doing it in order to sustain, to sustain their life for cooking. Because, uh, for example now, if you say for, an, for a poor man to stop cutting down trees for firewood, then what do you have, what do you, what, what, what is this going to be the, 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 cross of, the substitute of firewood? It is the, the kerosene and gas. How much is the price of kerosene and gas in Nigeria? An ordinary Nigerian cannot afford uh, a liter of uh, kerosene that is that is cost as uh, as cost as more. It is, I mean, it is more than 250 naira per liter. So this uh, little contribution, we have to orient our people. Know that their their their, their activities. Are, are, are the things that are causing this, this, this calamity to, to, to our system. Because uh, there are some stress gases like, uh, you know, uh, uh, CFCS, the chlorofluorocarbon, is caused by the electronic devices we are using, the methane gas, the carbon dioxide, and what are all, all, all this. So they need to be oriented. That's just my contribution. I'm calling you from Regatikun Kaduna. Okay. Thank you for having me at Duty Life. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sunny. Well, Sunny has uh, expound on uh, mobilization aspects. You raised three <laughs> issues, adaptation, mitigation, and mobilization. And uh, Dr. Jimmy not touched on it briefly. Now, he has revolved around sustainability. You know, I touched here before that if you're using forest resources, whether timber or non-timber forest resources, if we don't use this sustainably, it yeah, becomes a problem. Yes. If we go hunting for rabbit and you see the matured ones, you hunt the matured ones, you hunt the upcoming ones, tomorrow you go back. That is unsustainability now. Now quickly, from there, let's go to uh, uh, DG Green Grid Wall. What is the corollary between desertification in Nigeria and movement of people and animals? Sani talked about awareness creation and the need to create collaboration between the communities, the, ministry, the relevant agencies, and the national orientation agencies. Talking about letting the people know it's not culturally here, that you need to know that this is scientific, it is empirical. So, what is the relationship? Um, he has touched a very good and fundamental issue. In fact, um, for you to achieve any success, you need to relate to the people because they are there on the land, 
and the main cause of degradation in addition to the climate change. Um, yes, mobilization is key. For instance, my own agency, the first thing we did when it was established is to go out and establish a lot of associations across 184 communities. We met with them, we trained them, um, we organized them in the form of a society where they have leadership and so on and so forth. And uh, whatever we're doing, they are duly informed. We pass our own activities through them. We teach them how, how to plant trees. We teach them how to raise nurseries. And there are our own ambassadors within those communities. And whatever investments we have, they look after it. Did you also touch on correlation between culture and science? Yes. Uh, Sunny mentioned that clearly, that part of the problem is the meeting point between culture and science. Mm -hmm. um, culture, you know, in those days, in each of the communities, there is what is called, particularly in the northern part of Nigeria, there is what is called Sarkindaji. He has a significant role in the emirate and he's also a member of the, I mean, the uh, installation of Emir, whatever, and so on. And anything happening, they call him. He's responsible and he has his own agents that cut across all the forest, whatever, and so on. And in addition to that, each native authority or local government by them, they have their call, what is called forest guards. These forest guards are there checking on all exploitation of the forest. I mean, into a, what, what they, if you don't have a license, nobody has uh, allowed you to cut a tree, whatever. So, all these significant sort of cultural values we have there's not we have, we have almost abandoned them and this is the reason why you find that everybody will just go cut a tree do whatever i want to do um if we have these associations established it's easy to pass all sort of technical knowledge scientific knowledge across to them then because there's going to be regular sort of contacts and interface with these people um from my own agency's point of view now, in fact, um, we have taken up our, we understand, we look at the use of forest generally. And forest is used for firewood. And we identify, there are some people that are, who are using a lot of firewood. We identify them. For instance now, in schools, you have all the school kitchens. They are cutting big logs of trees and so on. It's the ones that are cooking food for, 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 for the students and so on. And you find that, I mean, all um, like prisons, in their own kitchens, they use a lot of wood. You go and find uh, bakers of bread. They're using heavy logs, uh, logs. One log means one tree is gone. While the farmer is just cutting branches and so on to cook his own food. And so we started to go around to see, we engage, the prisons recently, they are going to start working on that. We are going to engage the schools, Minister of Education and so on. We are going to meet them to see that, I mean, those schools stop using firewood and so on. At least, if you are able to get those people, they are going to minimize maybe about 20 or 30 percent of the use of firewood. And we now attach ourselves to the government agencies. If all government civil servants will be given one cylinder of gas. You can take it maybe out of his salary. When in, on, uh, Let me just I, intercept a bit. Yeah. Aliyu from Adamawa is on to Tuesday Live. Hello, Aliyu. Hello, Aliyu. You are on to Tuesday Live. It looks as though we lost that call. Eh? Mm -hmm. Can you just sum up? Yeah, so, I mean, uh, when you now approach this, you find that, oh, government, we are responsible. Please, let's stop this thing at the government level and so on. Let's say that we substitute this. And then we encourage all our civil servants to be using this, I mean, the cylinder and so on. And gradually it goes to other sort of arms of government. 
you go to the army, you go to the migration, you go to custom, you go to all the stuff, and then finally going down to the local government, civil servant, whatever, and so on. I tell you, if government is able to do that, almost 50% or more of the use of firewood is going to be drastically reduced because the local farmer is just taking a little bit. Most of the, I mean, uh, timber, or sorry, the, the wood, is being imported into the cities. So if we enlighten our own people and make them realize and use this sort of things through government efforts and so on, I believe that almost 50% of the use of firewood will be minimized in Nigeria. It is now becoming clearer that climate change and security goes hand in hand. And when we talk about participatory approach, yes. it plays a major role here. And uh, moving on, before I get back to the minister, Prof, we we'll look at the aspects where we are like coasting home to the solutions now, yeah. where Dr. Jimino was it's about to go into. But before then, let's take a break and be right back. Nigerians, our fearless officers and men of the Nigerian military are winning the war against Boko Haram. Today, all occupied territories have been recovered and Boko Haram has been degraded. Our affected brothers and sisters are getting their lives back. However, they are now after you and me. In our mosques, churches, schools, motor parks, markets, entertainment centers, and public gatherings. Be vigilant. Be security conscious. Report suspicious persons, objects, and movements to the police and other security agencies. The security of our nation is a for you and me. Nigeria Unite Against Terrorism. This message is brought to you by the Federal Ministry of Information and Culture. The struggle for independence had been a long and tough one. Our founding fathers and compatriots sacrificed their comfort and even shed their blood in history afford to spirit away their sacrifices for immediate but temporary gains of today. Let us emphasize what unites and not what divides us. Working for the unity of purpose with a stronger vision for a better tomorrow. NTA, growing with the nation. Nigeria, the only country we can train with remarkable potentials to excel. Let us believe in ourselves and change our attitude for the sake of our country and generations unborn. Let us revive our cultural values which are our essence as a nation. Let us renew the spirit of patriotism and hope in our dear country. Do not take or give bribe. Be punctual always. No more African time. We can't expect to be global citizens and operate on African time. Join the queue. Insist that people are attended to on a first-come basis no matter who they are or where they come from. Nigeria, good people, great nation. Tapeo. Make you report any crooked person, object or worker jube movement to police and security agent demo. The security of our nation now work for all of us, so plus including me and you. Nigeria, make we unite against terrorism. The Federal Minister of Information and Culture bring on this message. issue-oriented innovation talk show. Thanks for tuning. Stay tuned to NT Tuesday Live. We did a Vox Pop and we got the views of Nigerians. Let's take a listen to it. I think uh, if we can have afforestation, I think we will have a good climate change within the country because, you know, we have a kind of deforestation daily year in daily year out like in other developed countries most of our companies are supposed to be in one area there are places that are meant for residential areas 
But here in, in Nigeria, anywhere you have money to buy land, you build, you can decide to use it as a company, you can use, use it as a residential houses. But if a place is set aside, this is an industrial area, this should be for government, this should be for residential. If that is done, our environment should be protected. Then two, we should imbibe the spirit of growing trees. All our trees are being destroyed day in, day out. Like in where the area I come from, every dry season, the children will go and set fire in the bush in the name of hunting. Government should do something about it. There should be an enlightenment, there should be an awareness. Unlike during those days when we were in secondary schools, we have extension workers. They are no more there. If we have those people in agriculture, they, ask, they tell us why we should protect our forests, why we should reserve our, our, our farms and all of that. But those things are no more there. Where are they? The global issue now, you can see that there is a kind of a global awareness about the environment. So all hands must be on deck. Everybody must come on board to protect the environment. And how do we protect the environment? There are a lot of things. The government has to be involved. The people have to be involved. The, go the government has to create awareness. Let there be massive introduction of planting of trees in the desert environment. Like those desert areas that are encroaching to the southern part of the country. And dams too. It would be very good for us to construct our dams in every part of the region in Nigeria. So the earlier we stop cutting trees and practicing what is called deforestation, that will assist in reducing climate change. And we have to look for an alternative for generators because that also creates what is called noise pollution and air pollution, you understand? Right, planting of trees, not just trees, maybe economic trees. You know, we just in your environment, you find yourself mango, mango, you know, oranges, you know, just to keep the environment, you know, give sense. And at the same time, the, the aspect of uh, erosion, in make sure you keep your cutters clean. That's the most important thing, you know, because, for example, now, the desert in Groshan is really approaching the, the desert area. Tree needs to be planted in those parts of the countryside. I think we need to tree more. That was the view by Nigerians, and you could see it there, it is all about the people, the government. Government alone cannot do it, it's about all of us working together, participation here. Now, from the minister, we'll go to Lagos to get views from uh, Dr. Jibuno. It is clear, by the last uh, planet, one planet summit in Paris, the World Bank president talked about the fact that from this year, no country will be funded if you are handling any project that is on fossil fuel, yes. but green energy, and that leads me to the way forward to this looks clearly about the green bond. What's the update on the green bond? Well, good story. The green bond launched at the end of last year after the Paris uh, conference was fully subscribed. We have 10.69 billion naira in our kit. The debt management office has written to us this last week to line up the items that will be used. The Federal Executive Council at the tail end of the year approved nine universities that will be powered uh, using solar energy. Actually two are for uh, gas, so they are out of the green bonds, but the seven that are left will be powered using solar energy. That's what we call energizing education, and this will be part of the process. They will use part of the process from the green bond uh, that was fully subscribed to uh, fund this project in the Ministry of Power, uh, Works and Housing. Then we have the afforestation program, which GGW is handling, Federal Department of Forestry, uh, Desert uh, Department, and the main ministry as well as the Forest Research Institute of Nigeria that has four colleges of forestry across the country. They will also benefit from the funding of this green bond. So why Nigeria decided to go and get this, uh, launch this bond, and by the way, this is the first in Africa and the fourth in the world after France 
Poland and uh, 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 Fiji, uh, we started modestly. We have explored the 2018 budget in various MDAs, and there are line items worth about 200 and something uh, billion naira that could qualify for green bond. So we are positive. We are going to go again to the capital market. So you think it, 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 it could go in any way to check what we are discussing? Yes. The, the more you reduce the use of fossil fuel, if you don't use generators, like in most universities you see, they have there are some universities that have more, more than 10 sets of 10 sets. Mm -hmm. Almost every major site, the library has its own, mm -hmm. the uh, laboratories have their own. If it is a teaching hospital, the hospital will have their own, the theater will have a separate thing. Every aspect of the university will have power. So if you target these areas of high demand, if you decide the main library, as well as other departmental libraries could be powered through solar panel. If you decide that the laboratories could be powered through solar panel, you are going to have zero emission because you are not going to use fossil fuel to power a generator. So that will contribute to reduction of emission and therefore reducing climate change uh, issues. Secondly, if you plant more trees and do this afforestation, you are increasing the forest cover and you are increasing the chances of absorbing the carbon dioxide that is harmful to the atmosphere and then the more oxygen that is released for cleaner air. So we are positive that using the process of green bond to finance green related uh, activities will go a long way to help us in addressing climate okay. uh, change issues. Okay, let's take this call from Mwobodo, calling from Enugu. Hello Mwobodo, you are on to Tuesday Live. Hello, Wubudu. Well, I'm sure if he's still on, we'll get onto him. But before we get to Lagos, Prof. Now, some would say if the World Bank from this year is not going to finance anything fossil fuel, and maybe the Honorable Minister, imagine he was a private citizen, and Goni, a private citizen, and he says this would be a threat to my survival, my livelihood. Do we start to lose anything? Well, um, you know, financing of projects in medium income countries and low income countries is a problem. So I really wish most of us who argue with the World Bank for good and for bad uh, tend to think that these countries should have been given a longer notice so that they would have had the opportunity to adapt. To tell you the truth, one of the reasons at the time that we in the U.S. did not sign the Kyoto Protocol was that we looked, I was in government then there, and we looked at the uh, possibility that if we signed that, then we would have to change the energy system of the United States, which is still essentially coal-powered. Uh, who would take that blame? It was an election year, and what that would mean is that to try to do that would have raised energy costs for the general population and nobody was willing to take that risk. So Nigeria is not isolated from that, all the developing countries, so it's the same thing. But yes, it will, as you have heard the minister, uh, go a long way for independence of Nigeria in trying to uh, make sure it has a sustainable energy future and also promote green technologies. So the green bond is an excellent thing. I don't see any other way that that could be done to finance things because a lot of these things have to come from the private sector and they will always need investments to support things. So it is a good thing that has happened and I hope that many participants from the so private I ask this question. Yes. One of the callers, I think from Kaduna, talked about the poor man who lives on firewood. Yes. Now you said don't cut down firewood anymore. And yes. the next question is, what do I do next in place of this? Well, that is why, for example, the uh, Minister of Environment was at one point, uh, and I think my brother here was part of that effort, to promote green stoves. A lot of things that may have initially high cost over the long time have much lower cost over time. 
spread. So one of the things that could be done is to try to find alternative support. Say, say that stove, that's not very expensive. You know, when once somebody starts, the rest will copy. Okay. So there are alternatives. Okay. It's not that firewood mm -hmm. always has to be used. Okay, let's take this call f from Grace, calling from Abuja. Hello, Grace. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Tuesday Live. <laughs> oh, we lost that call. <laughs> now, let's go to Lagos. Dr. Jubino. Following from what Professor Hillary said, now it is clear when it all happened, it was as though government was not doing anything. It was as though it was just government, government, government. Now it is clear that this whole thing is about participation, the people, the government. What should Nigerians be doing now that it is clear that climate change goes side by side with security implications? Twenty years to debate uh, the climate change issue. Uh, the Ministry of Environment is only about twenty years old. Um, like I tried to explain earlier on, if only we can return greenery, the henchmen will go back. If we return natural greenery in the territories where you see. Something that we all must understand is that the average nomadic Fulani man does not want to be urbanized. So the situation we find ourselves today is a time bomb because they, there is no way they can settle down permanently in the territories where they are, where they have encroached up or down. So how do we go about this? We have identified the fact that, yes, Lake Chad is a major contributor to the kind of uh, a, a farming territory that one needed to be able to operate. We have also identified the fact that the river basins, six of them in the north, most of them have been depleted completely. If we can restore them and then see how we can work on this great green wall issue to stop the desert from encroaching, then the process of greening the whole area. It's, it may take some time, but the best time to start is now. If not, we're just going to go on and on and on. Let's see how we can return greenery. If we don't, then the security issue is going to get worse. Because not only that those henchmen that have migrated to the Middle Belt, to the southern part of Nigeria, will stay there permanently. More will come, especially with our porous borders, from those countries that I mentioned earlier on. And let me tell you something. It is very easy for a, a Cameroonian to come into Nigeria. It's very easy for a Chadian, a Nigerian, a Mauritanian, a, 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 somebody from Republic of Benin. But let Nigerians try to go back to those countries. They don't want us there. They don't accept us. So why can't we just begin that process now of regreening the, fringe, the fringes of the desert, at least from the little that has been achieved from the Great Green Wall Project or the Shelter Belt Project, we can begin to push back the desert and green the whole place and get this Fulani nomadic people to go back and start living their normal lives the way the they did before 1972-73. And that's my stake in this matter. Call from Suleiman from Abuja. Call from Suleiman. Hello, Suleiman. Hello. You're welcome to Tuesday Live. Um, thank you very much. Going the very quick, 
and some of my contributions. What I would like to make a point of correction in the issue of uh, nomadic moving from the north to the south. It, does not, it didn't start just 40 years ago. More than 100 years ago, if we can recall in our history, and limiting insecurity to headman movement from the north due to the desertification of what I view, it will not be justice to the topic you are having on climate change and insecurity. One, let me put this clear. We are talking on desertification, going green, or getting entirely on a very fundamental issue on climate change control, which is physical planning, physical planning issue. We for land is a limited resource. We know that. There is a story, I don't know how to the specificity of this during the days of Roy Kinkela in the 40s when he was playing. Uh, in the hospital, he called his attorney and told him that, look, go and get more land because it's the only resources that is not in production. All other things, you can get it available for land. What am I saying? The United Nations Center on density per hectare, I think it's 120. What are we having in Nigeria? How can we curtail, how do we distinguish our preserved areas, just as one of the commentators you put, he says, Grindel, residential, commercial, even though in the 21st century we have what to call, uh, uh, they call it, I think, uh, the planners call it uh, uh, compactively mixed land use in terms of the uh, physical development cost. The physical developers are entirely out of the scheme of R&D. However, there are the custodians, the managers, the, the preservers of the state that land in question. Uh, in our partition system, we only consider the liquidity aspect, that is the economy. But the land budget is the federal government do not have a single land to itself, but has a trust in our loan to the administrators of the state. Now, the question is, this great land you are talking about, this, uh, what are you, I say, the custodian are the state governors. Uh, let me now go to, uh, to move into Java. Uh, well, just just to just to observe you, please. If you can listen to me. We are looking at climate change and security impact. This, this is what I'm trying to point out. Now. Beautiful. I'll make it brief, please. Now, Time is stopping on our side. That is, that is why I say we should not limit it on headman issue. Uh, the issue of agriculture, food security. It's another, a very devastating security issue caused by climate change. And it's, by the norm, it's not by the normal, by farming. Now, uh, the control, some of the control measures, the Honorable Minister is talking about uh, the green bond and what have you. But, uh, some yes, uh, that one is a portion blame. There, there are some purchases by his ministries. Of course, not during his uh, tenure. One, uh, the first climate, co uh, climate change control mechanism, safety system, or what have you, over how many billion era was, uh, was purchased by his ministers. Nothing, nothing, nothing has been implemented. Thank you so much, sir. I think we are, we are taking much of from you. I think we have picked a few points from you. He has talked about farming practice, planning on the part of government food security and uh, land use forms is still within the ambit of discourse following from what dr juvenal said from lagos 
What can you add up before I get to the honorable minister? Well, the fact is that um, most Nigerians are still, this is still an agrarian country, uh, regardless of uh, the, <laughs> the intrusion of oil and gas. So agriculture is where a lot of people can be impacted. So if that is the case, it means that climate change uh, mitigation and climate change adaptation efforts should uh, place agriculture as a priority. Uh, sustainable farming practices, uh, teaching people irrigation, teaching people, there are many, many, in fact, uh, sustainable agriculture is a major, major uh, field of uh, knowledge. So um, in most of these countries, I mean, you know that Israel uh, should be a desert country, and it is, but right now it's been turned into a very agrarian society in which they produce a lot more than many other countries in the area of agriculture. So it can be done. And uh, sentiments aside, uh, those places in northern Nigeria that need that done, that should be done because it is to the greater security of the country when you look at the country as a whole. So uh, agriculture is one major, major sector. The energy sector, yes, because this is where you have a lot of insulation. This is uh, the tropics. This is West Africa. So uh, why should all the street lights not really be solar? They could be. And I'm very happy to hear, I wasn't aware of this, that the minister is now saying that one of the green bonds and uh, objectives is to take a number of universities and make them go solar. Uh, that is important because it's not only an issue of provision of uh, sustainable energy resources, it's simply also that of employment. There will be a lot of technicians there. Uh, we would like to see this country just be like many of these other countries, German, Germany that has many solar technicians all over. They will be inventive if you challenge the intellect of Nigeria. Okay. It's been established here that all this is about expansion. The land is there, it does not expand, but the population expands. We have had cases where a reserve is within the community, and as the population increases, the community through their administrative structure approaches the agency in charge and say, look, yes, we give you this much, and government has the right to own this land, but we are expanded. Could you please de-reserve de some areas and allow us further farm into these areas? Because I'm going back to the minister now. Now, if you adapt, you mitigate, you don't mobilize. It becomes a problem because awareness is important here. Now, one of the persons I talked about the need for mobilization. Dr. Jubino talked on that. Now, going back to the people and the fact that we need to synergize, you talked about that Minister of Environment, National Orientation Agency, Ministry of Agri, and other agencies. What's the way forward? The way forward is to continue in this trajectory and to ensure <clears throat> that uh, that collaboration is at the forefront. I recall when in one of my visits to the Northwest, precisely in Sokoto and KB states, we realized that at the beginning, people were not comfortable with the trees we were planting. People were assuming that we are more interested in the trees than actually human beings. Otherwise, why do we have to waste a lot of water? You have to understand the psychology of the man living in dry land. There is acute shortage of water, and like I said earlier, when people travel probably for the whole day to look for water, and the water is there by the corner, but we are watering the trees. So we have to open up, we have to let them know that it belongs to them, we have to allow them water their livestock, we have to allow them to take the water for domestic use, and in return, they now decided to be assisting us in managing this plantation. Otherwise, if you do that and forget about them, by the time you come back the following morning, the trees are gone. Because they can't understand why a tree will be more important than human life. And this is natural. So people need to be sensitized, they need to be mobilized, they need to understand that it is for their own good and that if they do that, at the end of the day, they will be the ones to be the custodian of this thing because actually it belongs to them. So uh, it is an area where we want to put more emphasis this year to ensure that whatever is put in place, 
the borehole that is sunk, the watering points are allowed for people to use, for livestock to use. And then we also allow them to intercrop. Within the trees that were planted, they can plant their beans, they can plant their granodes and many other crops. Okay. So that's agroforestry <coughs> and that goes a long way to <coughs> get the people fully involved. Okay. Mohammed is on to Tuesday Live from Medugri. Hello, Mohammed. Uh, we lost that call again. Could you tell, please, sir? So, uh, mobilizing people, working with them, and you not only use the National Orientation Agency, because they are available in all the 700 plus local government in this country. You need to get the state government to key into these programs. You have to own it. The local government, though nowadays are a different ball game, but they need to also be involved so that since you cannot be doing this thing from Abuja or wherever you may be, those who are living close to the environment should be the ones to take up this issue and move it forward. We are working as seriously towards that and we believe with the new uh, way we are taking these issues, there will be more greater chances of success. Okay. Well, we have seen the issue of regeneration here. If we use the environment and we don't have a modicum of regeneration, the challenge of security comes in because it's all about containment. Mm. If the forest is there and you don't use it sustainably, it goes extinct. And the challenge of survival, uh, survival of the, of the fittest comes in. So, talking about the, the, the uh, Great Green World Project, is this going to reinforce your campaigns or your strategies? Indeed, yes. But uh, first of all, let me come back to the issue of uh, the agriculture and so I mean, the Prof. Doct. and my Honorable Minister. Uh, you see, we need to look at uh, some scientific approach towards ensuring that uh, we increase yield per unit area. If you are producing so so, so number of bags in one hectare, let's apply some technology so that we increase it with double or three times. Could we just take this last call from Joss? Okay. Hello, Tond. Hello. Tong. Hello. Hello. On to Tuesday Live. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, presenter. I really love the program. And uh, I give my kudos to uh, all the uh, people on the on this platform discussing on this important issue. Uh, there's something I look at uh, democracy has brought to us uh, because people do not take things seriously when it comes to human life. Uh, in those days, we have the custodians of the land, custodians of our customs, which are the chiefs, the emirs, uh, the village heads, the uh, 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 the Waziris and others that have been contributing to the survival of the land, the people, their culture. But you see, democracy came, they took off all the power and stripped these people from their powers and made them look just like other figureheads. And these are people that know the environment very well and these are people that can instruct for anybody who is cutting trees to stop cutting trees. They know that person and know him to his own house. But you find that government will bring out policies from Abuja and the village head is there. The information will not properly pass. Even when the information is properly passed, they cannot have the ability to enforce it because the citizens now look at them as they are no more strong enough to enforce anything because the police are there, the civil defense are there. And these people do not know how to handle this uh, uh, issue the way it should be handled traditionally. And this environment is our life. And if we cannot hold these people close to us by the government to pass proper information, 
definitely will have problem of insecurity. We will have the problem of uh, 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 the environment being destroyed. You know, there are a lot of things that we need to focus from the grassroots. And the failure of the local government itself has contributed last, uh, uh, very, very well in not supporting this program. Because most times when they do this program, they do them politically. And when another government comes, the project is still abandoned. Another person will come and challenge you that the way they were doing it is not proper. And so we continue having problems. But if government can call all these village heads, call these chiefs, emirs, call them close and say, this is a problem. We are giving you power to enforce this to the grassroots. And everybody knows that they have the power to enforce. They will definitely stick to all these programs that government is bringing up. And we are allowing insecurity to come into this because the village head, when they see a visitor, and when they raise an alarming, they will say, ah, these people, they don't want uh, visitors to come in. This doesn't want uh, uh, other people to come into the society wherever they are. But there are proper identification that could be done if these village heads are given power, these chiefs are given power to identify who is coming in as internal immigrants, who is coming to my own place and is settling at what. These issues can be mitigated to ensure that we also are controlling the influx of people to, 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 to various places in the country. But we leave the country so porous and the borders are so porous and we cannot control it alone by the security who are controlled by government. Thank you, Tom. And so the, co the contribution is that I want us to continue to focus from the grassroots. Because this is where the fundamental problem is. Thank you very much. You were on, on the point of, has this reinforced your strategies? Yes. Yeah. Now, Tom has emphasized on the need for the rural area grassroots. Indeed. To be the focal uh, area now. Uh, for instance, now, the Great Green Wall is uh, designed to ensure that, I mean, it is taken off from the grassroots, even from the law establishing it. We have what is called uh, implementation agency at the federal level. We have it at the state level. We have it at the local government level and also at the community level. So all these structures are going to be put in place to ensure that, I mean, there is adequate sort of, uh, I mean, uh, participation by all sectors from the federal going down to um, that uh, the community level. I was talking before Mr. Tong came in yes. about uh, and you made some valid points. scientific approach towards yes. uh, increasing yield so that the population is ex expanding. The land is almost contracting according to my honorable minister, <laughs> desertification, uh, erosion control and so on and so forth. So we need to apply something to ensure that, I mean, this piece of land that I have, I must increase the productivity with about three or four, four times. We introduce what is called drip irrigation, because the major issue is water in the, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the dry land. If you are going to minimize the use of the water and get the best out of it, you give the plant only what the, that plant requires in terms of water and the roots itself. So we introduced this sort of technology and people have embraced it and I think we have almost about uh, nearly 50 different locations where this thing. So we're going to increase on that eventually okay. and uh, at the same time we will we are going to increase what is called farmers manage natural regeneration this involves planting trees in the periphery of all farms because if you protect your own farm you stand a chance of getting double yield because you have protected the crop from the desiccating wind and mechanical impact on the crop you are and at the end of the day you are going to have almost double that increase. So we should approach all that to ensure that, I mean, the little land that we have, we use the best technology and so on to get the best out of it in terms of uh, maximized yield from that. 
And at the same time, um, we should also take our own private uh, sort of uh, uh, partners. In Nigeria, you find that, I mean, we have so many big companies and so on and so forth. Nobody is coming in to give some, uh, uh, some percentage of what they are doing in terms of, let me help this issue of climate change. Let me help this problem of uh, insurgency, whatever and so on. I mean, we need to engage them also to realize that they have a civic responsibility also uh, from the, a lot of the profit they're making to apply it back to the communities so that, I mean, people can make, I mean, uh, utilize it and, I mean, to minimize all this uh, insurgency, I mean, uh, conflicts, what have you, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, uh, this is a point I wanted to drive. Okay. To prove, somewhere someone said, when you talk about climate change, Africa cannot have a common voice on climate change since they are affected differently. Here is the Nigerian situation now. Yes. Now, it shows that if the, prop the web is properly weaved, yes. then all, all this shows that a lot of agencies need to come to work together. Somebody has talked about National Orientation Agency, Minister of Environment, Minister of Agri, name it. Federal forestry, state forestry, good a thing. What we are discussing here falls within the concurrent list. Yes. So, moving on, it is clear if we manage the environment well, whether oil, whether fossil, whether clean, security will be taken care of. Definitely. Moving on, as a professional in this area, what would be your advice well, to the people, to government, and the way forward? Three things. First, the uh, premise which somebody uh, brought out that uh, Africa... Africa cannot <laughs> have a common voice on climate change yes. since the, yeah. every country has a different perspective. Yes, but there are some commonalities. Number one, Africa needs data. Okay, needs data at the density levels that can be used to do things, implement things, not just understanding. When it comes to implementation, you need information at the density level that is required. Okay, so Africa needs that. Africa also needs, I'm saying things that Africa needs as commonalities now. <laughs> Africa also needs uh, well-trained people. Africa needs uh, extraction of talent from the people, including indigenous ways of doing back things home. back home. Let's yeah. adapt it home. Yes, now. even in Nigeria, indigenous ways of doing things, and that knowledge cannot be discounted. Uh, he said something about culture, how some people used to do it. There have been problems of this nature. Drought is not new to any part of the world. Drought. It is just when it is extended over a long time that we can look at it. That concatenation over time makes it so uh, pliant when it comes to climate change. But uh, local communities have had ways of dealing with drought uh, for many years. So um, my advice comes, uh, that's number one. Number two, Nigeria is trying to develop sustainably. But what is sustainable development? First, population management okay i think it's he who said that the land stays the same but the uh, population keeps increasing so there are four elements mm -hmm. to sustainable development and the country must develop ways of addressing them uh, population every country that has developed well on the issue of environment has had to deal with population increase second uh, economic development all of the things that we've been saying here uh, cannot happen without the country doing well economically because um, a democracy cannot be sustained. That's why we cannot cut off development, energy, all these things. So it's got to do that sustainably. Third is social equity. So we are talking about equity too. If you have resources of all that we are doing and it's unfair to a certain part of the country or the other, we cannot say that the Fulani man cannot be alive, yeah. right? That's not possible. So there's got to be some equity or somebody from the Southwest or somebody from the Niger Delta. And then finally, there is environmental stewardship. And that word stewardship is uh, very deliberately chosen. That is, you have to manage it. You have to be a steward. It doesn't mean maximize everything. It just means optimize it. So those are the four elements. OK, thank you. Yes. Dr. Jubino, can we have your closing remarks? I think I'll go back to where 
I started, and that is that uh, we are debating this issue of climate change, the effect it has on security. The um, security situation is uh, very, very serious at the moment. And a lot of that has come from migration. Um, my heart goes to those communities that have uh, lost people in the last uh, couple of weeks. Uh, this debate here, I, I thought, was also meant to talk a little bit about that. What do we do in the immediate, possibly medium term uh, solution? How, what kind of solution do we apply to or recommend for the current crisis we have? And, and that is to at least give some guarantee to the various communities, particularly in those 11 states that have lost their, their land to desertification, uh, to, to kind of begin to let them know that this is the plan we have to restore greenery, to bring back grazing fields, to bring back the water bodies that supported their lives, their farming communities, and then also let them know how one is going to go about land reclamation. Because with the encroachments happening by the day, we also have to think about land reclamation. So those are the things that I, I would like to, uh, because um, the prof talked about Israel earlier on. It took Israel 50 years to recover the whole of Israel from the Negev. I have been there. Uh, I did uh, university studies in ben -Gurion University on the science of desertification, all on this issue. So I think we have to begin to look, because we don't have too much time. Uh, as we speak, crises are brooming everywhere now, all over. People are being uh, slaughtered. So we have to begin to give some hope, not only to those that have been deprived, but also to those that want a place where they can graze their animal heads. Okay, back in Abuja, we'll just take this short break and return to the minister briefly. Okay, it's not, it's not ready. Now, we have heard from Professor Hilary, we have heard from uh, uh, Dr. Gibuno, and uh, the DG kick started it. So, in conclusion, Oral Minister, let's tie up all this. Thank you. Um, we need to actually realize that uh, the whole country is involved. When you have wheat law on your finger, the whole body will not be comfortable. So one part of the country is having a problem, the rest of the country will definitely be impacted. We are talking about desertification. We tend to even forget that this issue of climate change has impact in the coastal area. When you lose the mangroves, as a result of coastal erosion, yes. you lose the breeding ground for marine life. Everybody knows, anybody who is conversant with marine biology knows that these are areas where the fish, the periwinkles, the shrimps go to lay their eggs and hatch them before they move into the high sea. If the mongrels are destroyed, that marine life and ecosystem is also yes. destroyed. So. If we don't look at this thing holistically, we run the risk of getting climate migrant. And that's exactly what is happening. Imagine the coastal effect, people moving, like you said earlier, on to the north central part of the country and the south moving. The crisis on the little resources available. Mind you, we must also have to manage our population. If we don't do anything about the issue of population, sustainable population development, we will continue to generate wealth, but the per capita income will not increase and it will impact negatively on the people. People will not get out of poverty easily. And the whole idea of our SDGs is sustainable development in such a way that people will be positively impacted and you create more wealth. And therefore, that issue of fairness and equity comes into place. These are issues 
but it's for everybody and all hands must be on deck. It is not for government alone. It is not for the federal government alone. It is not for the state or local. It is for you and me as individual citizens of this country that have a stake in this country. The president used to say that this country belongs to us. We have no any other country. And globally, we say there is only one planet. There is no planet B for us. So if we destroy our planet, it is at our own risk because there will be no plan B for us. So we have to know this and make sure that we support all government efforts. As far as this government is concerned, the policy direction is clear. All that is needed about environmental issues is being cutted properly. Last year alone, the president signed three instrumental ratification related to the environment on the issue of Green Wall, on the Paris Agreement, and the Minimata Convention. So we are good to go, but we need the key in of every stakeholder including you and I. And I call on Nigerians to raise up to the occasion, avoid sentimental issues, and address the issues what of climate change. What if by chance one particular agency refuses, want to play within silos? We cannot operate in silos again. We don't have that liberty. I said earlier on, the Ministry of Water Resources is working on rehabilitating all the reservoirs for irrigation purposes. In the next two or three weeks, there will be an international conference anchored by the Ministry of Water Resources in collaboration with Agri and Environment on the Lake Chad issue. It is an issue of interbasin transfer. And you heard what Dr. Jibuno said about getting the waters back to Lake Chad okay, and then so creating the livelihood that was lost. And that will address positively on the security issues. I believe we are on the right trajectory. And if we move on this direction, definitely there will be positive results. Okay. Before we go, let's take, before we wrap up. Did you need your card? Sinoni Restaurant, serving authentic, delicious, and healthy Chinese cuisine. Climate change security impact was a focus on Tuesday Live tonight. When you take a look around you, you realize that the, the environment is indispensable. Everything we do dwells around the environment, whether artificial or natural. Even where we are, without the environment, if we don't use it well, it cannot work. It's about the people, not just government alone. That is how it has been on Tuesday Live tonight. Let's start with uh, Dr. Jubuna from Lagos. It was now having a chat with you from Lagos. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Quickly, the Honorable Minister of State for Environment, Ibrahim Osman Jibril, it was nice having you. Thank you very much and congratulations to Dr. Jibuno for turning 80 recently. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. General, National Agency for Great Green Wall, it was nice having you. Thank you very much. And, and our uh, own dear Professor Hilary Nyan, we're so lucky to have you because you're always in and about. <laughs> Uh, running away from climate change. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> the environment remains the storehouse of boundless resources. Let us manage it well. It is not only about government, it's about the people and government, and together we will move on. The security challenges will be surmounted. That's it on Tuesday Live. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.